Now, as you see before you here, uh, this slide, as I move into my message this morning, um, Every Child Matters, 215 in memory and solidarity. 26 uh, of us gathered yesterday morning uh, between 11 o'clock and 1 at staggered times, wearing masks and doing our best to be socially distanced to tie 215 orange ribbons to the trees at the front of our property facing Bank Street. And so this is, of course, in memory of the children's lives lost at Kamloops Residential School and in solidarity with our First Nations people of Canada. It's a tangible, a tangible sign of our recognition of their grief and our responsibility as a nation in allowing that to happen. And it's in solidarity with them that substantial change has to take place in our response to the abject abuse and neglect of our First Nations peoples. And I'll flip through a few of these slides here for you as you see some of our people placing the ribbons on the trees. That's the Hall family there. And there's uh, Ann and Dawn and Elena and Heather. Um, just a, a group of us as we spent time together. And we have people uh, walking along the street, stopping and taking photos of our doing that. And one, one person, I, I gave him a ribbon and he uh, put one on himself, Jason. And uh, so there we have it. But when you think of the number of people that drive by Southminster on a daily basis, there are thousands of cars that go up and down Bank Street. And so this is a way of, of our being in solidarity and recognition of the kind of sorrow and grief that our indigenous peoples are experiencing yet again. So with what has been working its way through the media and Canadian society at large this past week, like a scythe through wheat, I'm reminded of Winston Churchill's famous title, The Gathering Storm. There has been a groundswell of remorse and a crescendo of outrage over the revelation of the validation of 215 unmarked graves at Kamloops Residential School in British Columbia. And I use the, the term validation versus that of discovery because this does not come as a surprise to our First Nations peoples. It does not. They have been raising concerns for decades regarding the thousands of unaccounted for children who were forced by our governments into residential schools never to return. There is deep sadness and mourning at this revelation, but not surprise. Now, with the assistance of ground-penetrating radar, the remains of these 215 indigenous children, some as young as three, were found at Kamloops Residential School site last month. Once the largest residential school in Canada, with an enrollment peaking at 500 in the 1950s. It operated from 1890 to 1969, mostly under the Catholic order, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, but the federal government ran it as a day school for nine more years before it closed in 1978. This morning I'd like to spend the next few moments with the revelation of this horrific tragedy of the residential schools with which we've all been confronted afresh this past week. And the numbers of unmarked graves at Kamloops Residential School, uh, it has been a jolting and sobering moment for the nation. For the indigenous of Canada, 
the scar tissue of tortured memory has been torn off afresh with this revelation, revealing once and for all um, of the gaping wound for all to see of the culpability, our culpability as a society, an indelible stain on the Canadian legacy and psyche. We cannot, we cannot close our eyes. We cannot turn our heads. We cannot look away. As a people and as a nation, we must confront this head on. We must face this disturbing chapter of our history and search for satisfactory yet elusive, I'm sure, answers as elusive as they may be, and find ways, find ways of healing. This morning I want to introduce you to an artist, a very famous Canadian artist. Some of you may know of Kent Monkman. I suspect most of you do. Uh, but Kent Monkman is one of Canada's preeminent contemporary artists, and he is an interdisciplinary Cree visual artist, and he is of international renown. It's quite incredible what this man is doing. He's a member of the Fisher River Cree Nation in Treaty 5 territory, which is Manitoba, and lives and works in Dish with One Spoon territory, which is Toronto. And that Dish with One Spoon, I, you know, I, that's, it, there's an awful lot of meaning to that phrase and that description of an area of Canada. The dish represents the land that is to be shared peacefully and the spoon represents the individuals living on and using the resources of that land in a spirit of mutual cooperation. There's so much the indigenous uh, could and can still teach us. So it is also more important um, it is also more than appropriate that I use Monkman's paintings today because he's not only indigenous, but he's also two-spirited. And you heard Anne describe what two-spirited means. Now, his work is known uh, to be provocative, uh, and these are provocative interventions into Western European and American art history. Monkman explores themes of colonization, sexuality, loss, and resilience, the complexities of historic and contemporary indigenous experience across painting, film, video, performance, and installation. Now, if you're not familiar with Monkman's work, it can seem somewhat irreverent at times, but in realizing that he uses a tremendous amount of symbolism and metaphor, it all makes perfect sense. This one is called the scream. It's self-explanatory, is it not? As we consider what the revelations that have come to us as of the end of last month. The scream references the fact that for over 100 years of Canada's 150 year history, now take this in, for over 100 years, of Canada's 150 year history, indigenous children were taken, often forcefully, from their parents. Over a century, we have been doing that. Ostensibly in the name of education, hence residential school, but what is now understood to have been a way to disrupt family relationships and break up language knowledge and cultural continuity. And of this system, Sir John A. Macdonald stated, Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence, and the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. I guess it's no wonder that residents of Charlottetown rose up this past week and forced the city to take the statue of McDonald that was on a street corner and, and to remove it because of what people felt was 
the offensive nature of its presence and the message of complicity that it shared with Charlottetowners. So they removed it, and justly so. This one's called A Mother's Grief, and aptly so. This painting is from the, ex the exhibition Shame and Prejudice, The Story of Resilience. So in regard to the scream and a mother's grief and other paintings in this series, Monkman was quoted in the Huffington Post as saying, and I have it here, that he wanted to walk us back through time and stitch together a counter narrative that reflected on indigenous experience. This is what he is doing here. So these two paintings and others point us to the racist and xenophobic attitude enshrined in government policy of the day, enforced by federal law agencies, as you can see, Royal Canadian Mounted Police here, and enacted and sustained by the church. Oh my. Now, I'm going to draw on some articles that I've been reading uh, in the Globe and Mail and other places. Uh, this is, um, as you can read, uh, Mary Ellen uh, Turpel Lafont, a Cree lawyer and judge at, and British Columbia's first representative for children and youth. And she offered an article for the Globe and Mail, and I'd like to cite some of, of her thinking here. And she called, um, okay, she called the revelation of the mass grave site an unthinkable loss, but as she importantly made clear, it was also known a known loss. That is, the deaths were undocumented, but the community had knowledge of them. Unthinkable, undocumented, and yet known. And that is a quote from Chief uh, Roseanne Casimir, uh, and she is the chief with the uh, Kemloops at Schwapmec uh, First Nation. And this is the reality faced by indigenous communities across the country. This is why I agree with the usage of the term validation, because it was unthinkable, undocumented, but yet known. And of course, the Honorable uh, Murray Sinclair, just this week, he says, now we are beginning to see evidence of the numbers of children who died. We know that there were probably lots of sites similar to Kamloops that are going to come to light in the future. And, and he says this, and we need to begin to prepare ourselves for that. And he's right. The 2015 TRC report noted huge gaps in the available records of deceased students' names, genders, and even causes of death. And six of the TRC's calls for actions, number 71 through 76, have to do with missing children and burials and demand a clear plan to tell families where their lost loved ones are buried and make sure cemeteries are well maintained. The TRC produced a conservative estimate of 4,100 of roughly 150,000 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children forced into their schools, died of disease or accidents. And as Sinclair intimated, it could be as many as 6,000. So British Columbia at this revelation, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Quebec, and Ontario committed this past week to helping support First Nations group wanting to conduct similar searches of the former residential school sites that dot provinces of Canada. And $27 million from the federal purse uh, is going to help affect that. So Turpel Lafon goes on to say that the necessary change must attack the root causes of the injustice faced by indigenous peoples. The state's long-standing treatment of indigenous peoples as subhuman without basic human rights 
And she goes on to list what, how this was manifest. As individuals, they have experienced racism, stereotyping, disproportionate, disproportionate harm and violence at the hands of the state, closed off social economic opportunities. And as collectives, they have endured the dismantling of their governmental and legal systems, the outlawing of aspects of their culture and society, and attacks on their family systems. No wonder former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin called this cultural genocide. <clears throat> And vast numbers of children in care, how this continues even today. Overrepresentation in the criminal justice system, poverty, inadequate housing, diminished educational and economic outcomes, and high rates of suicide. And Trapel Lafont goes on to quote, only when indigenous peoples have the opportunity authority, accountability, and support to care for their own communities and families through the governments they have determined and according to their own laws and traditions, will the challenges that are with us be, be addressed. Jody Wilson Raybould uh, is no stranger to any of us. Again, she has been, uh, she offered a, a special report to the Globe and Mail uh, on June the 3rd. And she says, yet there remains more uh, we must do. Thankfully, many Canadians are demanding to learn more, and we are, and this, this is good. But she goes on to say, and I agree with her with this for sure, but this learning must be done on the terms of the survivors. It is for the descendants of the children, including any living siblings, parents, or even grandparents, and for their community to guide what happens next. They will let us know, she says, what we must do. And just as we all do when our loved ones leave us and must be honored and remembered. Now let me close by sharing something that uh, comes from my own uh, doctoral research, as my research was in the domain of reconciliation, emanating from my experience of war in the Balkans back in the early 90s. In, her, in hearing the news of the large number of unmarked graves in Kamloops and the realization that there will be more, many of us are anxious to do something tangible that will somehow make, make a difference. I was reminded of a quote that I ran in our worship service bulletin just a few weeks ago by the famous American black poet uh, Maya Angelou, and I like what she says. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And that is so profound and so true. In recent decades, social psychologists have done much research in the domain of reconciliation. Their contribution has been significant. The journey towards reconciliation is, and must be realized, it is incremental in nature. It is small steps, small successes that over time become cumulative and trust is earned where there had not been none. Now one of the principles that, that social psychology has brought forward in terms of reconciliation is that of something they call establishing supraordinate goals between groups that have been in conflict or estranged or alienated. Now a supraordinate goal is one where two groups experiencing, let's say, strained relations for whatever reason, that these two groups commit to work together toward achieving a mutually agreed upon and beneficial goal or project. And the key is that the goal or project is something that both parties 
desire but cannot achieve alone. Now that's significant. They can only find success by forging ahead together through cooperation, through collaboration. And in so doing, they can transcend that which divides them. And new narratives are written as they come to see one another through new eyes. And the journey towards the healing of memory begins. Superordinate goal. Coming together to work toward something that can only be achieved together. You begin to write a new narrative, a new history. And you transcend conflict and alienation. And then... The healing of memory can begin, which is a long process. That's something that's called instrumental reconciliation. Now, I've, one of the theologians that I've studied, you've heard me speak of him before, Miroslav Volf out of Yale, and he has a, a term that he calls double vision, and it fits into this, especially when you consider trying to create new narratives, a new understanding, and it's called double vision. And he says... What this is, is that when one sees the other through new eyes, and that's what this is, we see another through new eyes, but also the flip side of that is when one begins to see oneself through the eyes of the other. So it's not only you seeing the other person, the other group, through new eyes, but it's being able to see yourself through their eyes or from their perspective. And that's when understanding occurs. That's when knowing occurs. And that is the journey that you make together in writing new narratives. Now, in many senses, this is where we are as a society with the indigenous of our country. We need to write a new narrative together. So let us look for ways to journey with our First Nations peoples in ways that bring meaning for them. Not the assuaging of guilt for us, but meaning for them. And following through with the TRC calls to action is one good place to begin. Because the calls have emerged out of intense consultation with the First Nation peoples of our land. I want to offer a prayer this morning. This is from uh, Reverend Murray Pruden, and it's there with you, for you. I've printed it this week because I wanted you to have it. The uh, National Executive Minister of Indigenous Ministries and Justice for the United Church of Canada. And I'd like us to, to pray this Pray this together. So wherever you are at home, if, as you see that before you, pray with me. Creator, we give thanks for this day, and each day you grant us life to walk on this great land, our mother. Give us the heart and strength to come together in prayer in this time of mourning, reflection, and peace. The news we have heard these last few days is of our relations, our families, the children who have been physically taken away from us and who have now been found. And with this news, we grieve for their memory, for their struggle, for their spirit. We pray for good understanding, guidance, and love for all our families and communities who will need direction and resolution at this time. And we come together in prayer and ask for your light to guide us to be a part of that needed peace, support, and resolve for everyone who is reacting to this great tragedy in our indigenous nations of this great land. Creator, be with us. Allow us to be brave. Allow us to be strong. Allow us to be gentle to one another. Allow us to be humble. But most of all, allow us to be like the Creator's love. Peace be with us. 
We lift up our prayers to you in love, trust, and truth. Peace be with us all. And let us share the, the Lord's Prayer as is found before you. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.